Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today's guest collaborates with many local farmers to bring farm-to-table style food, which got me thinking about farm-to-table. What is it? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Farm-to-table is consisting of or relating to freshly local grown or produce food. Farmer markets are great examples of farm-to-table, picking up produce directly from a farm that harvests the produce and directly to your kitchen table. But the purest form of farm-to-table means a table literally at a farm, and a cook or chef prepares to serve from the farm at times directly from the field to the kitchen table for consumption. Farm-to-table is not, however, going to the grocery store and picking up organic food or driving to the store after visiting a farm. The restaurant cook or chef should be able to name the specific farm or farmers from where they were sourced. It is a unique relationship between farm and farmers and restaurants, cooks, and chefs. It is a mutually beneficial relationship. Farmers are able to sell their harvest while restaurants receive fresh produce to delight their consumer taste buds as well as their own. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. Farm to Table offers fresh natural ingredients because they require no preservatives. This also helps keep more nutrients in the food. Studies show that around 75% of Americans do not eat enough fruit as it is. That is not good. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, tooth decay, osteoporosis, elevated cholesterol, and some cancers are linked to bad eating habits. There is also a large benefit to the environment as food is transported locally, going only a small distance using less fuel and less carbon emissions. But the benefits go beyond great health. Farm to Table supports many local small businesses. In 2008, Iowa supported over 300 family farms and bakers with their Farm to Table Farmers Mark. And that's why an entrepreneur should care. Beyond the fact that fresh food is better for everyone's health, Farm to Table also helps support local farmers. It is a great way to ensure the money we earn working is reinvested into our community. The beauty of Farm to Table is entrepreneurs working towards a common goal. Restaurants, cooks, chefs working with farmers, growers, and delivery drivers, in some cases, to bring fresh food to every kitchen table. Fortunately, I live in Oregon where I do not have to go far to find fresh, locally grown produce. In fact, this next episode lifts several local farmers where food is being purchased from, and I would highly encourage our listeners to go out and find a farmer's market or farm to help show their support. In Oregon, our climate provides our state with the ability to grow so many amazing types of produce in our field. Pay homage to those workers in the fields, not by buying from Trader Joe's, New Seasons, or Safeway. Instead, seek out your favorite farm and inquire if you can purchase from them directly. But don't just ask about the food. Ask about the process. Ask how the farm came to be. As an entrepreneur, networking is key. And what better way to network than breaking bread over a freshly homemade dinner? Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest met in culinary school at Lynn Benton Community College back in 2005 and spent years cooking at some of the best Portland establishments. With their traditional Latin American cuisines, please welcome the owners of Camila King, Mary Hats, and Rodrigo Puerta. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have Mary and Rodrigo. How are we doing today, guys? Wonderful. Great. Uh, Great. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm really excited about it. Um, I actually know Mary's aunt, somebody I actually work with in the professional world, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about food today. 
we're going to talk about Hosina Kin. But that's not all that you guys do. So we're going to we're going to first let's introduce the world to Mary and Rodrigo. Can you guys give them a little background who you guys are and then we'll kind of get into the business. Uh, first, it's comida. Kin. Oh, sorry, comida. Oh, yeah, kin. yeah. <laughs> Not kitchen, <laughs> but food. Uh, yeah, my name's Mary Hatz. I was born and raised in Hillsboro, Oregon. Um, I know I went to um, Lynn Benton Community College and Oregon State University with a Bachelor of Science for Restaurant Food Service Management. And culinary school is where Rodrigo and I met. Nice. So what, what's culinary school? The Lynn Benton Community College. Okay. And Rodrigo, what about you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so school just kind of started late for me. But, yeah, we met in Lynn Benton Community College. Um, I was born here in Portland. Uh, moved around quite a bit up in Washington. Went back east uh, to Pittsburgh for a while. And came, um, settled back in Oregon. And that, you know, that was about every six years transitions moving and went to school and uh was you know when i was gardening a lot at some point in my life and was in a horticulture program but realizing that uh, studying science at the moment wasn't at the time wasn't my thing and the books i just they're just too big <laughs> for me so but i realized that uh there was um uh, so i found out that this little benton where i was studying the horticulture um had the culinary program and so, I mean, I got into that pretty quickly and because when I was, you know, at home from school, I was also I was watching was Food Network and cooking at home and learning, learning to cook, but also realizing that I could cook. I had background. My, my dad was a chef and we had a family Mexican restaurant. And, and so I was like, oh, wait a second. This is all familiar to me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it was an easy move to. Uh, for a career path and. Um, you know, that's a two-year program. Uh, like Mary and I were in each other's vision the first year, but it was at the end of the first year that we actually met. And then um, pretty tight the, se- the second year throughout the, the rest of the school. And then we got married in 2011. Mm-hmm. We moved to from Corvallis to Portland in 2009 and worked in Portland restaurants um, for, I don't know, around seven years. Yeah. Went to Mexico for a few years and then moved, or not years, but for a few <laughs> months, um, traveled around for nine months and then moved. To, uh, after that, we came back and ended up in Hillsborough at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so what, so a little why, more traveling. <laughs> yeah. So why culinary school? Uh, for me, um, I was at OSU my freshman year. It wasn't going very well. I didn't know what to do. Wasn't enjoying it. And I went and talked to my advisor and she said, well, you know, we have a, we have a, just started a program where you go to culinary school and then you take a business school from OSU. And so it was a partnership between the community college and OSU. Oh, interesting. And I said, well, I'll give it a shot because it was the culinary school aspect. And I loved it so much. I was only supposed, to, I was only required to do one year. I loved it so much. I did it for the both two years. Um, and then I finished at OSU. Nice. So let's, let's talk about the transition. Cause you mentioned you both, you know, traveled and then you went from working in Portland restaurants to eventually going to Mexico for a couple of months and then coming back and, and starting this food cart. What, what made you decide what kind of gave you that, Okay, we're ready to start our own. We're ready to venture out on our own without doing the restaurant. What what, what was kind of that aha moment for you? The abridged version is the pandemic. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, let's hear it. I mean, yeah, yeah, the pandemic was. Well, I think the pandemic started the business, but I would say first, um, you know, we worked. We moved to Portland working to get, uh, and we got a job together um, at a hotel restaurant. And pretty much, I mean, that was just the chops where he had to, that broke in our chops real quick. It was a hotel. We were doing hundreds of covers in a couple hours and, you know, like a Cadillac of a line station, a a cooking line and two people per station, just busting out food. And, you know, it was fine dining. And 
So we were touching all sorts of things, mostly seafood for me personally, um, that we, you know, we're touching things again that we touched in culinary school because after culinary school, pers- I was like in pubs and co-ops and just cooking and just really learning food again, um, you know, in the real world. And, and then we got into the restaurant and learned the restaurant game in the real world. But we also realized real quick that, I mean, burnout was there and it was present. And, but we do, you know, we couldn't take that as our profession, well, not professional burnout yet, but job burnout every, you know, I mean, I left after the first nine months I think, for at least a year and then I kept moving around, but my, you know, I wanted to learn as much as I could. I mean, different cuisines, different chefs, different kitchens, different coworkers. I were all the same, honestly, <laughs> the coworkers, but then uh, we ended up managing a, working together at a, after Mexico, we actually got hired at a taqueria while in Mexico. Oh, interesting. Uh, I got hired in the last few months as a sous chef and then um, started working there. Uh, when we got back, like two days after traveling for nine months, just started hitting the grind again and started working, getting settled. And uh, I'm not, I don't remember if Mary joined me there right away or later, but eventually we ended up working together um, and she was, we ended up working together in this restaurant and in that we were kind of like, Oh, this is too much. Like it's just the stress and it wasn't ours. And, but there's this, you know, the two of us, I was kind of a, I was a chef. Mary was kind of a sous chef and we felt this, we felt this ownership, but it wasn't ours, you know, but we, we did have this ownership and it was, we did keep it consistent in that way, but everything else beside that was just out of our control and, and very intense dealing with, um, so we kind of t- promise each other never to own a restaurant. <laughs> like we ever, we ever get into this situation, we should stay out of it. Um, so then, in 2019, we found ourselves. We bought this food truck. The plan was that we were going to just use it every, like during the summer, for like once a month, do a festival, you know, as a side gig, um, just to make some extra cash. But then uh, the pandemic hit. And we, I was at a catering company at that time and catering ceased to exist. So I had no job and Rodrigo was transitioning into something else, but then that didn't follow through because pandemic. Um, So we found ourselves unemployed with a truck. We said, well, I guess we'll start cooking. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We started, I started working on the truck in the winter, just replacing the equipment. And again, the plan was to find a job and then get on the festival certificate, do that part-time, and have steady income coming. But, uh, yeah, the pandemic had some different plans, and, yeah. And so we just, what can we do? And um, I'd worked in a restaurant in downtown Hillsboro for about a year or so, and I became familiar with the farmer's market. Mm-hmm. And, you know, did, did uh, they had, like, a, a market kitchen thing where I, when I was a chef at this restaurant, you know, she asked if, I'd be willing to do a demonstration and we did a demonstration at the market and um, thought that was pretty cool and fun. The market itself was just awesome. It's good to be a part of, be out of the restaurant that everybody walked by during the market because the market's going on and, and to be into the market and uh, feel like, uh, you know, we're, we're being a part of it. And um, so uh, we had a number to call when um, it was time to start the business and um, called uh the manager the farmer's market and easy you know no problem getting in and you know we had to do th- go through the trials and you know again no problem and um yeah I just started figuring out how to do it because <laughs> there was you know we were it, it was all pretty on I mean, we were fly. on the fly I mean we were scrambling to get sign up on the truck for the first day <laughs> we had paper we had a paper sign with each paper with the letter of comida wow. kin Right. <laughs> wow. so, so with so many food carts out there, how, how do you guys differentiate yourself? We are strictly seasonal farm to table cuisine. Uh, we only buy from local farms for oh, our produce beautiful. and awesome. our meat, eggs, grains, grains, not all the grains, but uh, as much as we can. Um, Corn and beans. Cause we're, I mean, we're in, the heart of agriculture out here surrounded by so many small farms 
um, who are doing really good regenerative organic practices. Um, and who've had to go to regenerative because, you know, when Mary's a kid growing up out here, it was all farm. Yeah, that's very true. I grew up in Mount Angel, Oregon, and, you know, I farmed the Willamette Valley myself. And so we are yeah. in the mecca of, of really the, when it comes to the fruits and vegetables, or more so the vegetables, right, we're kind of in the area. You get the fruit down in the Northern California area. But, yeah, Willamette Valley has is just ripe with produce. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so what, who are the, some of the businesses or some of the organizations, farms, that you guys currently work with? Oh, it's a list. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's give them a shout out. I'll, right, right, right. I'll name off three of them. Perfect. Uh, Sparrowhawk Farm, Stoneboat Farm, and that's connected with Campo Collective and De Leon Farms. Um, yeah, we started working with Working Theory Farm. Pruitt's Farm. Yeah, the Pruitt's Farm out in Cornelius. There's uh, a Edible Stories Market Garden. La Finquita del Bujo. Um, Mason Hill Cattle. Mason Hill Cattle. Tabula, Tabula Rasa. Rasa. Quality Plains. Great Grains. Wow. wow. And the list just keeps growing. It's it started with Sun Gold Farm. It started yeah. with two or three farmers, and it's just grown. That is yeah. so awesome. It, yeah, this year, as, a, as we saw business grow exponentially, <laughs> as every year, um, the we found and we picked up fest, a festival again and some bigger larger events this year again i was i was kind of concerned about what the farm to to be able to produce to be able to have enough vegetables for you know hundreds of people mm, a day gotcha. which yeah. you know in the festival we're going to be doing thousands a thousand or two and um i was pretty concerned about sticking i want to stick to, we, we have values and we want to stick to them right and right. we're we see that i mean we we support the local agriculture local agriculture and you know i wanted to i want to keep supporting him especially this big event for us because i mean the the festivals paid off the truck for us in two weekends wow and and so you know we we know there's a lot of money needed um you know we invest a lot into going under those but we sell a lot. And so we wanted to help out. So I had to, I did some more, you know, I was like, just kind of expanded the web a bit more. Yeah, got to do some outreach. Start reaching yeah. out to find some more farmers and um, so that, you know, we could, we can do what we want to do. Yeah. And how, so one, one thing I want to, first I want to kind of make sure the listeners. So folks, I, I hope you are hearing that if you buy actually a meal from this food cart, you're supporting so many local farmers because the produce is actually coming directly from these individuals. So that's just one other reason why it's also important to kind of continue to help support our local entrepreneurs because they also have connections. Now, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, the networking and kind of building out that network. How important has the network been to grow your business? 100%. 100%. It's huge um, because people come to us because they hear from somebody else at the farm. And, you know, the craziest thing about it is that it's not even, we too have just met so many people in the community um, just in relation to, and, and pretty much feeling like we're hugely involved in the community because of relation too, is as far as like, well, the, you know, well, we already know each other and, yeah. you know, there's, there, there's so many, it's a small world, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, uh, we're in a small town and as, as spread out as Hillsboro seems some, um, you really, it really, what it, it did in my eyes kind of centered us more into in our community and fun and realizing who our community is. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that like, again, so spread out so many different walks of life in a town, but, uh, you know, and it's hard to share with all of that. It's hard to take, it's hard to, um, have all of those experiences from all different ranges but when you have that community the support is huge and it's yeah. immense um and you really you really it really helps us stay focused in our values and our goals our missions and um you know and that's it, the experience of just being able to eat ourselves this food and and work with it and understand it more um has changed our lifestyles uh personally for me definitely um, I know Mary too has always been a vegetable eater, but I mean now even more. And 
Um, but, uh, you know, and that, seeing that in our self-improvement with, yeah. you know, that, um, these, this stuff and, and, and our community and understanding why they do what they do, yep. you know, really, um, really been a, a good thing for us and, uh, you know, helps us want to share that. I like it. Now, what would you, what would you two say has, you know, this is, you mentioned you didn't want to get into the restaurant industry, but now you've gotten in the food cart industry. What, what would you say has been difficult about starting the food cart business? Everything. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Um, Rest is, rest is the first thing that comes to my mind. Well, and you know, one of the first things they teach you in business school is that when you first start a business, it's, it's a pendulum. It's going to be all work. It starts, it's all work. It's going to be all work because it's, you just have to put everything, every ounce of your day into it to get it up and running and trying to find that balance. And we're so just reminding ourselves that when we started this because we didn't want to get into the restaurant because of burnout, but we're working, you know, 70 hours, 80 yeah. hours a week still, but it's for ourselves. It's on our own time. And eventually, as systems get in, put into place and work themselves out, things get smoother. And you're, we're able to find a little bit of time here and there now for rest. Finding places where you can put those boundaries in practice of like, this one day a month, I'm not doing anything. And, you know, starting small with that, too, how do you incorporate that balance and get that pendulum to slowly shift so it's a little more in the middle? Great point. Yeah, and the, um, the it's our own stress, too, you know? It's like we create it. Yeah. We can, we can get rid of it, if, you know, if it's too much. Um, that we have that power, and it's very... You know, at being our third year of Comedian too, we've learned and, and found. Um, you know, we've been able to streamline and fit, and we we had the grace of the customers to do what we wanted for the first year, year and a half, and then by the end of the second year, we were we had a kind of a steady menu and, and a concept that was <laughs> that we felt we could work with and not. And and we're gonna we found the consistency mm-hmm. and the streamline and yeah. and then with that you know the space and the time opens up for um, our personal lives and um, in the community and in these extra projects. Well, you know, one of the things you guys were talking talking about was stress, right? You guys were talking about right. the. Have you guys ever since you started this food cart? Have you ever had a moment of self doubt? Oh yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, many times <laughs> uh, especially the you know the the second year this year so there's been no time to doubt anything <laughs> to be um which is you know it's great keeps us busy but you know uh, there's we we're looking at you know talking about what what can keep us up at night sometimes and you know that the freedom has really washed away a lot of the stress of, oh, I forgot this, so-and-so's going to be on me about this, or, you know, the responsibility to somebody else, or, or, or blame, you know, that kind of thing, scenario. But it's really the personal things we take on, and and whether, and, and then our conscious about it, you know, that, that can keep us um, stewing at night, or, you know, what if this, what if that, but you nowadays i think um you know the the doubt it creeps in but only when chaos is around yeah (laughs) when there's chaos and there's just the two of us and when you know because there's just the two of us chaos can happen real quick uh during service when it gets busy because uh we're not ready if we're not yeah if there's there's less preparation which um it can happen sometimes we might judge a uh we might judge an opening differently as far as like uh well, i can wait or i'll i'll try to get this in and uh, but we take those risks to yeah. create time for ourselves too you know and so walking into something like that it's uh 
you get busy and all of a sudden the service is over and I'm I look at Mary I'm like what happened was everything okay <laughs> like <laughs> how was the food you know yeah. <laughs> so, you know we do a lot we do a lot ahead as far as the preparation to make sure that there's not really you know the chance of screwing the, the food and and how people see our food with with flavor and texture it's hard to screw that up you know we try to set that up where it's just it's going to be it's going to be a, a wait or you know time and um and whether they really enjoy it or not uh, that you know is something to worry about but when i can't remember what i you know what i the first couple of years, it was so a little so slow, so much slower. That I remember, I could remember every dish I put out. Um, some of these other days, when you, I can't remember these dishes. I kind of get a little anxiety about <laughs> what, how food was and why, because you know, just it's been a shift of remembering everything I've touched to not remembering things I've touched, and um, so and you know, getting our menus um, streamlined has helped a lot too because we at first we were changing our menu a lot um i mean because we are seasonal some one week our farmer will have something and the next week he won't and so we would make whole new dishes around those around these things but as as time went on really this is too much you couldn't keep track of everything and so there was doubt doubt, a lot of doubt (laughs) but then once we realized that no we just need to do you know, we'd take, we started with a menu that was 12 items big and we just slowly chipped away and said, nope, it's too much. Nope, it's too much. And until we have four items on our menu, because that's what the two of us can handle. Yeah. And now it's um, tacos, tamale, a sandwich, soup, salad, cornbread. And w- within those concepts, we change what's in them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Nice. Now, one of the things you mentioned when you started the the food cart or the the food kind of going around and doing the different farmer's markets, you were able to pay off the, the truck in two weeks. So how did you guys actually finance the finance the company beforehand? It's all grassroots. Did you guys do venture capital? Did you have to take any loans out? Or just, just like, let's just let's just roll up the sleeves and do it. How did you guys finance this? Well, in, when we first were offered the food truck, um, it was with these large festivals. So we did Pride Festival and the Seattle to Portland bike race. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Those are um, huge festivals too. Huge. Wow. Our very first experience in the food truck was Pride Festival. <laughs> first time I jumped in it. Yeah, talking that about was. swimming with the sharks pretty quickly. Eh? Yeah. That's, that grossed us eighteen thousand dollars wow. in one week. That's incredible. And we, I mean, we've never opened the truck before, so wow. um, we between that and the STP, we were able to pay it off. And then with the uh, uh, for the first half of it, we had our we took our personal savings and invest in personal money and then the other half or half of it. And then the other half we paid off with the two festivals. And I want to quickly do one, another shout out, uh, the Crave Catering where Mary worked and I worked and who we bought the truck from, you know, they really set us up for success. And, you know, he, they wanted to get rid of the truck. They didn't, they had more business and kind of just wanted to stick to their guns and push the truck thing aside. But, uh, they really lined us up with logistics and, and made, you know, really helped us be successful um, in that. And, uh, and for us, it was like, it was easy to understand. Yeah. And when I didn't, you know, it's like, is this really going to happen? You, like, yeah. I'm going to have like 40 people or uh, 80 people just standing in line and I'm supposed to be serving them the whole time all at <laughs> once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things you guys actually, cause I'm, so I'm, let's, I'm not a food person, right? I I'm, I'm, I'm love food, but I've never like cooked and nothing like that. Let's go through that process. What what do you really, what is the preparation? You mentioned the preparation process. What are some of the things that people in the food industry that maybe us as the consumer don't really think about that you have to think about? What are some of those preparation things that you have to go through that we don't think about as a consumer? First, we have to make a menu. Then we have to look at our farms and see what, produce is available and then we put our order together so there, basically there's a lot of office work air quotes office work that goes into getting ready before you even touch the food so then once we put our orders in then we have to go drive around and pick up all of our produce so we probably spend about three hours a week if not more driving 
to the different farms because with the local farms, there's no delivery service like there is from large food service, um, like an FSA or Cisco. Right, right. So we spend a lot of time. There is, um, depending on where you live, and because right, they yeah. do deliver to Portland, yep. uh, they can't come around here, but they all don't because um, not all the farms we buy from service the restaurants. Ah, right. Gotcha. So we pick up, and then we have to clean every vegetable because the farmers they'll do. Their, it's called a field wash, but it's just to get like the big clumps of right, yep. big basic dirt just off, hose and down. Then, yeah. So then we have to wash the vegetables and then we have to prep the vegetables, clean them, uh, you know, chop them, cook them before they even get into the dish that they're going to be. Wow. And then that menu, you know, with when you're thinking about vegetarian food, you know, because we didn't want to stick to. um, We started out vegetarian. Yeah, we started out vegetarian because we, you know, the meat, we just, a lot of personal values and, yeah, and yeah. you know, we see the meat industries and um, the, uh, our opinions around that, but um, yeah. so developing a menu uh, with these vegetables, you know, we do have to, we have to think about nutrition. Yeah. How, like, yeah. Is it okay? This is good. Is this going to be satiating? Are we going to satiate the customer with this? Like, how are we going to work this in? And, is it going to get them protein? Are they going to get be enough nutrients to not have protein this meal or whatever? Oh and, man, didn't you, I had to see those? I would never have thought about that stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, so like a lot of lot, and then the vegan things. You know, when we were talking about vegan, we're like, well, cheese can really replace a lot. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we we're like, oh, nuts and seeds, and and you know, in Mexican food and researching more doing more research and um, getting into pre um, Hispanic foods. You got pepitas, sesame seeds, you got these ancient grains and all you, you got the mice, the corn and um, beans. the beans. And so like developing a vegan Mexican menu is really easy. <laughs> yeah. True. But keeping it seasonally seasonal yeah, with, yeah. with the tough, was you know, is the challenge and um so that took work and that took confidence um you know and and doing that stuff and but we ha- with that we had to stop playing around with the special that special really find that rhythm and stick to okay well i we are going to do tacos yeah. we are going to have tacos all the time so what can we do to make uh, you know what what can we cook, work, work with to have a filling, satiating um, taco that uh, isn't full of just carnitas and or um, or carne asada, which you know we love. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know how can we how can we replicate some of that stuff and uh, and then you know trends you start following trends and you're like well can we replace that birria with some potatoes and cheese and oh, you know yeah potato. See? <laughs> yeah and you know, well, you know. I, you're one thing you're also doing is is, is kind of keeping our community healthy as well because one thing i don't think people understand you, you were mentioning it was really easy to create a vegan menu with the latino the mexican you know culture and their food because historically latinos you know mexicans we we kind of really focus on eating our the agriculture right we 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 filled in the lands and we ate what we what we worked with and that's why you actually see, you know, diabetes at such a high rate in the Native American population and the Hispanic population and the African American population is because historically our bodies were not used to this processed food that the McDonald's and Taco Bells that we're now consuming. And so when we do consume those at a rapid rate, and especially at when you're going to Taco Bell and you see a sign that literally says sodium warning on it, and you're just, you know, and you're still consuming that meal that is really going to have some effects on your body as well. And so what you guys are really doing is beyond just having us eat healthy, you're really actually creating a healthy community. So I really do applaud you that. And not only that, but working with, you know, other local farmers is such a, such an amazing idea and seeing it continue to uh, grow is really been really, really unique. Now, is this your first, is this both of your first businesses? Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, and um, to reply to, you know, thank you for seeing that. Um, it, it took us a while to, it's it's hard to tell people, you know, you don't want to tell people that they're eating wrong. You don't want to say, hey, yeah. you know, like you should eat this, not that. And leading by example is kind of just the way to do it. Um, it's how we've changed. We started eating it. You know, we're very fortunate to do that. Um, so we, we've seen that and f- felt the pressure to personally to be able to share it, but also the pressure to try to help with, um, you know, bringing awareness to that. Yeah. And we've been able to create some programs um, right now. It's our only our second month, but we have this, um, it's called kin care program where um, we're just, you know, kind of crowdfunding with our customers. They've been very generous when we ask for things. Uh, Cause we do, a, you know, we do a free meal, free breakfast on Mondays, um, serving a, a community here um, near our nice. house and where we operate the food truck. Um, but we wanted to be more active, involved, um, and and instead of just that that Monday, we want people to be able to come to the truck and yeah, um, we want more accessible to um, eat- everybody. Yeah, because and- our price point is kind of high because we are local farmed. Yeah, um, so we we started this kin care fund where we're we ask. It's basically a pay it forward program where it's a donation base from our customers, and then. We take those donations, we turn them into gift cards, and then we partner with local organizations in the community who work with underserved or challenged folks. Who, or Hispanic. Uh, the Hispanic community. Um, so we, the last, our first month we did a lady who helps. Um, uh, she um, so beautiful dream. Uh, they go out and help uh, people with disabilities you know integrate into life and and they they help build uh their personal strengths and and to get them to be able to live a regular normal life um, without all the assistance and um but with assistance but also be comfortable and give them pride and um, all that wow we're gonna we're gonna connect more about this offline i'm gonna we're gonna we'll talk more about the we'll definitely get into the nonprofit world offline i think me and you might be able to do some collaborative work on that as well now from the business perspective you know you mentioned this is your first business what has been difficult oh um honestly uh being in the being in the capitalist world (laughs) (laughs) is it is that is our our biggest uh our biggest challenge because we, you know, we have strong feelings about accessible food. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so that's, and that's kind of where, where that was leading to is like our, who we're supporting now is, um, but so as a business, the challenges of um, being so small, it hasn't been crazy challenging with, you know, we have, finding a tax person we've been able to, to keep our stuff in check and yeah. um being small it's easy to uh it's easy to just keep track of all of that it takes time and work and um i'm not gonna i guess i'm not gonna mary does most of that so i'm not gonna say it's necessarily <laughs> easy but it's very time consuming yeah um, my goodness i experienced a little bit of it you know in the beginning but I'd say just do it, having to do everything ourselves because we don't have the budget to hire an accountant right. or hire a or delivery or get deliveries. And, yeah. Um, you know, we have to do every single thing ourselves. Yeah. And that, I think that's just, you know, that playing into time management. Like. So we, and uh, we, with our being in our community, it's very easy to not feel like a capitalist in a way. We have so much, um, our community helps us in so many different ways of just offering, uh, you know, all trying to make each other's lives easier. Working together with um, each other um, and having our little, you know, having our LLC above us, but underneath we're all just in the, we're weaving, weaving 
in between each other it's and with community, each other. Baby. We're a community. Yeah. I yeah. like it. What, what, what has been easy? Is, 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 has there been anything easy? Oh, just the every day, just, you know, when we keep working and doing what we do, it just unfolds. Yeah. Uh, that's been the easy part. <laughs> to, to, Letting it unfold. Yeah. Letting the, it unfold. The easy, easy part has been not not worrying about well it hasn't been that part's not where it, it's been funny how things have come to us uh, you know yeah. like just the like, sticking to our values is has been easy it is it literally makes our choices it, you know we choose on what we buy or don't buy through that or what we do or don't do through that and with that you know has been it's created kind of a magnet in a way um, mm-hmm. for us yeah, because we don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about, oh, should I or shouldn't I? Because if you just check in with your values, is this in line with what I believe? No, then okay. I don't need to. I don't need to spend any more of my time thinking about it. Man, that is such a great point. In fact, you know, Rodrigo, you mentioned things are starting to come to you. I believe, you know, as as you go throughout life and you give, eventually people start give back, right? And you, you kind of notice those people. Um, and I feel like that's the same way with this podcast, just going out and helping with communities, the opportunities that have been coming my way and the collaborations like just today, right. I'm, I'm actually really excited to talk about after this a little bit more about what you guys are doing from your nonprofit perspective. Cause I think we can have a real um, good impact on the community if we can collaborate as well. And I think already you guys are having a huge impact, you know, even with, without a collaboration. And so how do we continue to grow right together as a community? One thing I'm always constantly saying is, is we're a, a global community of entrepreneurs, right? Cause we're all interconnected in some way or shape or form. Cause what's happening out in another country is also going to affect what's happening in our country as well. And so just being mindful of that. So I'm, I'm really excited now. I'm going to ask this question to each one of you individually. So first Mary, I'm going to start with you. What motivates you? I think the extracurricular projects that we're working on is what motivates me to continue with the business because it's through the business that I can do these extra projects and not just our Monday meals and not just our kin care fund, but we're working on other, uh, you know, uh, starting to get into food policy and with the, um, with the with the community and and hopefully eventually with the city and getting some food policy put into place and um, really shaping the future of food our food economy here in, awesome. in Oregon that's amazing M- mark same question what motivates you um, change um, I think we can get so stuck in our lives and, you know, what, with what we feel comfortable in. Right. But, um, to being the third year, you know, like, yes, the business growing and, and more opportunities coming our way is, is motivating, but it can be exhausting. Yeah. But the thing about that is that we've seen change. We know that, what's happening is going to change. It's not going to, and if it, and then also looking back to seeing, you know, just what the pandemic has created with the food systems that we have in place that we didn't even think were systems. Like we just, Oh, it's food. We don't think about this stuff. Yeah. We don't, not everybody thinks about where they're, where, where that bacon is coming from. Nobody is that. Or how that pig, you know, lived the and so <clears throat> getting a little um insight into that stuff and and seeing oh this thing's changing and and um you know being in Portland and then starting a, a business in Portland or you know Oregon and Portland being a mecca of a farm to fork back in the 90s if not the 80s the you know that started but what happened to it where did, you know, where did the, those restaurants, they're still, they still are here. They still are there. And you just don't see as many doing a full, like, cause it's a lot of work yes. to yeah. 
they're they, the farms that we buy from are not a part of these systems that uh that are in place to feed to to create convenience um and feeding and so change um and knowing that there there needs to be change in in uh the way we eat the way we the way we spend our money the way we buy where we, where we purchase um who we spend our money with and you know supporting knowing that wait a second i don't have to i can i can find a way to support my local economy um that kind of stuff you know that's motivating for me because it when you think that you have to when you when you think about change you want to change the world like that's the first uh, this this could change the world what a great idea but that's a nearly impossible i mean that's thinking hugely but what you what bringing it back down to center and bringing it back to where you're at like that change is possible you just it start small it's okay we we all were crawling before we were walking yep very and, true you know and so um that is you know knowing that change is always going to happen, but uh, being able to notice, see, and uh, be aware of that and have the initiative to do it in, in, in a, a community that uh, has embraced us. Like we, we feel very hugged. Yeah. <laughs> We're in a big hug of our community. Love it. And Love it. it has been a huge motivating piece for us. That's nice. And, uh, and, you know, that's new for us. Yeah, that's good. And it has been. Yeah. Now, what would you guys say as, as small business owners keeps you guys up at night? My stomach. <laughs> <laughs> eating too late. <laughs> the hour, yeah. Not eating at the right time. And, yeah, just and, those hours, huh? You know, it's. It's not really the stress because there's. We're it's fortunate. only us to blame <laughs> if something goes wrong and you know, it, it all will get done at some point. And if not, then, well, you just have to say what, what needs to change then to make it doable. Right. So if, if we're not getting done, what needs to get done, then the system needs to change. Um, so there's, there's not really anything that other than our bad eating habits. <laughs> we, we thought about, you know, we thought about that because it was, I mean, not to just joke around either. Like that's very fortunate for us because yeah. we were really like, it's the business right now, this year, mostly too. Like, you know, first, second year, I could tell you that we probably went to bed just wondering, you know, those doubts, those personal, those self doubts, what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, this year, waking up, knowing we we're, we got to get to the truck where you have work. We have work through the summer. Those aren't, our, you know, cooking and making money isn't, aren't the anxieties uh, necessarily uh, versus, you know, just being able to take care of ourselves and yeah. whether we took care of ourselves well enough to rest. Yeah. That's a good night, point. You know, that's um, a good point. And you know, folks that are listening, if, if you're having trouble sleeping at night and you're eating at like nine or eight o'clock at night, that's probably why. And I know I'm pointing at myself when I'm talking to my, you know, talking to people <laughs> listening because I know, I know I do it often as well. Now, how do you guys continue to market yourself and grow your brand? How do you guys continue to tell people what you're doing? That is Rodrigo's. Yeah. The, you know, the social media with the Instagram is the only marketing tool we have. Um, the word of mouth our is community, the greatest. Um, doing what we do, it's again just sticking to what feels right. Because uh, uh, you know this, this when we we took a ro a small road trip this winter, um, about four or five weeks, and had no idea what summer was going to look like. And then you know coming back home. The anxieties get in. Oh man, what what are we gonna? What's gonna happen? How do we? How are we gonna start booking? And we gotta call them. We this person, that person. We gotta start reaching out to the wineries. We gotta do this, that. In a matter of two weeks, three weeks, when we got home, this we're booked out till September. I mean, just as far as oh, how wow. much work we could do. Um, and then, you know, working with people, trying to figure out other things. All of a sudden, it just stops. Like we can't do anymore. Like we're we were hoping to have an April 
that was going to be a little a uh, little more time to to do to find work, but as May through September filled up, people calling April just filled up as well, and um, you know April was our largest selling month since we've been open. Oh wow! Uh, and it's just it's only growing right now, and uh, so. Yeah, the, the things just started happening. And, I like um, it. The marketing, yeah. So, uh, so now, like the marketing and the growth, it's it's like, I just, I don't worry too much about yeah. it, which is really like it. It helps me at night too. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't get, <laughs> you know, because there, there's all these other things I wanted to do. Like, there's so much you can do in marketing, and um, I reached out also again community and people we've worked with before. You know, we've worked with uh, chefs and uh, that have their own restaurants now and um, and working with cooks that have their own restaurants now and calling and being like, well, because I like their marketing. How's, how's this work for you? Yeah. Um, getting advice and, yeah. uh, yep. and, and, you know, advice of it's raining if you can't hear. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was pouring over here earlier. Don't worry. Yeah, I, uh, the, the, um, so... You know, I, I talked to a a small um, restaurant that who's who we, we we worked with, and um, they were very gracious and just sending me their marketing person. Nice. Said give this person a call. Nice. Talk to him for you know we had 15, 20 minute conversation and and she was very direct with me, very nice but very direct, and I was I, you know. I was like, this is awesome. Like, yeah. Just, it really just helped me lay out a system to reach a customer. Yeah. yeah. I was just, I didn't know which boxes to check, you know? And so the whole marketing thing has also been organic and um, building as we go. And, you know, pictures, honestly, it gets me in trouble sometimes with my, my partner here. And, <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing? On Instagram posting. <laughs> is that really going to help? <laughs> oh, that is too great. So, so give the listeners at home some advice. Maybe, maybe uh, somebody listening is interested in possibly getting into the food industry. What advice would you have uh, for them? Have enough savings to not make any money your first and possibly second year. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, and, for me, it's whether or not that's through financing or whatnot, but yeah. you need to have like, when you're looking for capital, if you're going that direction, you need to include your finances for personal living because you're not going to be making any money your first year. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, go slow. That's, that's been our saving grace is slowing down. Yeah. Stopping sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Really. It's, Cause things move faster. Our brains move faster than we do. Uh, things around us move faster than we do. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, and so really being centered and and sticking to what you really want. Yeah. But yeah. but you know, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't try not to feel the pressure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, don't yeah, don't try to please um, too many people uh, without without your own without your own motives and like uh, you know, initiatives. And the food cart community is, is really embracing and really amazing. And um, we our commissary kitchen. We're in a, a, about seven other food trucks and our neighbors and the other food trucks that we meet out at events and whatnot. We tell them how long we've been doing it. And they, you know, it was our first year or second year, whatever. And every time they just say, you're doing a great job. Keep up the work. Don't give up. The first year is the hardest. I love it. I love the community aspect of that. Yeah. Yeah. Even, you know, we, we were with a bunch of taco trucks um, in our commissary and, you know, everybody's just so they're, we're all here to help each other and um, encouraging, very encouraging and um, love it. Helpful. Yeah. So, so for the listeners at home that, that want to continue to encourage and, and support what you guys are doing, where do they find you? How, how Rodrigo, how do they find your amazing you know, advertising on social media. <laughs> how do they? How, how do they? How do they? Uh, how do they keep up to date with where the food court is going to be? Well, yeah, follow us on Instagram at Comida Kin. 
Um, that is C O M I D A K I N. Uh, straightforward there, and um, you know our Facebook is linked to the Instagram, but Facebook we don't really interact with too much. Uh, we have our website Um you know we have our farmers up there. Uh, we through the website it takes you to Instagram to because we are mobile. Um, takes you to Instagram to to find us and and weekly on Instagram, I'll tell you where we're at, uh, or day, uh, you know, if you find us on the day during the day of, at least in the stories, you'll be able to find something. Perfect. Um, I'm not always the quickest on it, but, uh, yep, that's where we're at. And, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where the pressure is off a little bit because, you know, we have so much going on, but we do still need to, uh, we do still market because not most of our events are not private. We're just, you know, um, but, uh, we do like people to come out to the farms. You know, one of our regular places is, is at Sparrowhawk Farm um, near Glencoe High School. We do lunch out there on Fridays and beautiful place. And, um, you know, they've done, done nothing but embrace us. And, and we go out there weekly. Uh, they, they're, they're working on, they've even worked on the environment around us to, to create a, a better place for people to sit there, sit out and eat on the farm. And love it. Eat our awesome. food, interact with the farmers, watch them harvest, uh, uh, sell vegetables to the CSA members. They have a farm store there um, where they, they also support other local businesses through their farm store. And, That's great. Uh, you know, there's a whole full circle with, with, you know, with them, you know, spent grain from the brewery to the chickens. And, you know, we give our compost back to them to feed chickens and their pig and pigs and, um, you know, so it, it's fun to be a part of, uh, you know, see those full, full circle things happening. And uh, but yeah, uh, social media, Instagram is day of um, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. That's when we're open. That's you know, nice. that kind of just call it at that. And Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, start looking for us. And perfect, you should be able to find where we're at. Nice, thank you, Mary and Rodrigo. Man, this was such a great conversation. A uh, lot of great information. I'm very excited for what you guys are doing and the way you guys are impacting the community as a whole. I think it's really a phenomenal. And the way you're also supporting a lot of these local farmers, it's just a great, great thing. Now, for those folks at home, again, you please find them on social media. You can also subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter on the shadesofe.com, or you can follow us on the Shades of E at LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.